you define this radical hysterectomy, then what should be your answer? Okay, so this is basically the surgery which is being done for carcinoma of the cervix where we remove the uterus along with its surrounding connective tissue to a variable extent plus adequate vaginal margins. Okay, don't get confused that hysterectomy with lymphoid dissection is a radical hysterectomy. That's not true. Radical hysterectomy can be done with or without lymphadenectomy or even the lymphadenectomy has its own extent. So this is the surgery where you take out the uterus with lateral anterior and posterior margin with the vaginal margin. That can be variable as we know that there are different types or different classification of the extent of the surgery. Uh, indication we have already discussed in the last classes about when we were talking about the management. Basically the lesions, the T1, uh, the stage 1B1 or 1B2 means a gross disease which is less than 4 cm. Even the upper one third of the vagina or two third of the vagina, they are also the candidates. The contraindications means the disease beyond to that extent. If there are uh, gross parametrial invasion in stage 2B, uh, lower one third of the vaginal involvement, lateral pelvic wall involvement or clinical or radiologically if the lymph nodes are positive, usually we don't proceed with the surgery. Uh, 1B3 is a gray zone, most of the centers or surgeons usually they don't prefer surgery in that extent because ultimately the patient will lead, uh, lead uh, to the adjuvant radiotherapy which we don't want here. So the ideal situation is these tumors which are less than 4 cm without parametrial invasion and on imaging without lymph node involvement. Now the dilemma is uh, because we know that the radical hysterectomy is equivalent to the radio the radiotherapy also. So for the early disease, where we have both the options available, how to select that? Uh, here, a lot of factors, basically the patient letter factors, they come into the picture. Usually the young patients or premenopausal ladies, uh, we are more inclined towards the surgical option because we want to preserve the sexual and ovarian function. That's possible with the surgery. After radiotherapy, there will be uh, vaginal fibrosis, okay, and shortening of the vagina will ultimately cause problem with the sexual functions, as well as if we have to preserve the ovarian function and we have to give radiotherapy, either you have to transpose the ovaries above the pelvic brain, otherwise there will be loss of the ovarian function. So uh, in nutshell, if patient who desires the fertility or wants to preserve the ovarian and sexual function, early uh, age ladies, like before the 40 years of age, we are more towards the surgical option. Elderly and fit ladies for surgery definitely need uh, that. The concept is a single modality treatment. You have to select either the surgery or chemo radiotherapy. Okay, uh, which is quite in contrast with the head and neck carcinoma management because the, both the modalities are equal in the terms of disease-free and overall survival. Only the toxicity profile or the side effect profile or the patient-related profiles are different. So we don't want to mix those things up. That's why knowing the ureter is utmost important. We know that it has got segmental supply, but doesn't mean that initially when I was uh, assisting a uh, first case, okay, I was told that don't lift the ureter entirely from the retroperitoneum. But ultimately I came to know that, know that this is not possible. If you have to do a nerve sparing surgery or if you have to give a proper uh, parameter margin, it has to be mobilized. It has to be lifted up from the uh, retroperitoneum. But the key here is uh, there is a thin adventitial layer all around the ureter. It's a retroperitoneal organ, it doesn't have serosa. But in that sheet, the vessels, they run parallel, okay? So even if you have lifted it up, at least even the 10 centimeter long segment, but you haven't crushed those peri-adventitial vessels, okay? Then it will survive the ischemic damage. So you have to take care that you don't crush the organ. That's why most of the time, I even don't prefer lifting it by back. 
सिंपल आई थिंक द रेड द रबर लूप और अम्बलिकल टेप और योर वेन रिट्रैक्टर इज एनफ दैट्स वॉट आई वॉज टॉकिंग द सेंट्रल ऑर्गन द लोकेशन ऑफ दिस ऑर्गन इज सच दैट द डिजीज टेंस टू स्प्रेड टू द ब्लड एंड पोस्टल रिट्रैक्टर एंड लेटरली द पैरामीट्रियम मीन्स यूरिटर्स सो the dissection is little bit tricky and then comes the autonomic nerves also those also has to be taken care after the ureter the second most important thing is the blood supply the, the the comprehensive knowledge of this internal like system it's what is mandatory here because you need to ligate the uterine artery whether you are doing type 1 2 or 3 whatever depending on that extent but even Uh, taking care of the superior vesicle or the different other branches this is how that uh, this organ is not only supplied by the uterine artery but it gets branches from the ovarian artery and the vaginal arteries okay and uh, that was the answer of my question when i asked you that how after radical tracheotomy the uterus is going to survive because it's getting supply from the ovarian vessels then comes the pelvic autonomic nerves and uh, if you have to give proper results to the patient you have to decrease your complication rates and most of the time the complications are related either due to the ureter injury or due to the autonomic nerve injury ureter we have already talked given careful preservation of the autonomic nerves are also important see here the see uh, in other malignancies we tends to go wider and wider and take out whatever the things are there in the way here anyhow we are selecting a disease which is limited to its extent okay so you need not to go till the lateral pelvic wall and take the nerves from its origin here we are taking only stage 1b1 or 1b2 there the disease has not spread to the perimetrium there are not bulky pelvic lymph nodes also that's why it's very easy to save these nerves also while maintaining the radicality of the surgery that's why you will talk more and more about the nerve sparing here rather than about the rectum or anywhere else so in females about the radical hysterectomy and in males about the radical prostatectomy because the selection of the disease is a very early stage disease where you can uh, give a good oncological outcome as well as a better preservation of those autonomic functions so this is how it looks i'll i'll talk about details when i'll talk you about the nerve sparing surgery so this is how a pelvic nerve plexus looks like what you need to understand that the hypogastric nerves they are sympathetic nerves okay arising from the hypogastric plexus at the <coughs> central promontory the a paired nerves right and left then the s1 s2 s2 s3 s4 they gives the pelvic uh, nerves pelvic splanking nerves which ultimately joins up here and forms the pelvic autonomic the inferior hypogastric plexus so that region of almost 3 cm uh, it's a criss cross network of fine nerves so you won't see a big bulky uh, sort of nodule there it's just fine branching pattern of nerves there so uh, how to preserve the bladder branches i will talk in my later slides and uh, what is the implication of saving those nerves you will see the parasympathetic system and sympathetic system they act in a opposite direction here if you talk about the bladder basically we are talking about the sexual and the bladder functions here as well as the rectal functions so if there is injury to the sympathetic system if suppose the sympathetic system that means the hypogastric nerve its damage the parasympathetic system will get overactivated and will cause constriction of the urinary bladder okay that means what constrict of the urinary bladder means overactivity overactivity means uh, overactive bladder or sort of stress or urgent continence similarly if there is uh, parasympathetic injury the sympathetic system becomes overactive okay and that will cause atonia okay that will cause atonic bladder overflow incontinence bladder will get filled up and will 
you have to imply that. So this is how sympathetic and over parasympathetic. Sometimes if you injure, like there is injury at the inferior apogastric plexus, which is mixed sympathetic and parasympathetic, then it can manifest in different way. There you need to do either your flow material or neurodynamic study to evaluate the extent of the injury. Now coming to the history, see how the surgery has evolved over the time will give you a clue that what it's been done here. So we'll see even from the early centuries, uh, 17th and 18th century, there were reports that the uterine cervix cancer has been removed. But you'll see neither of these surgeries, they result into the fruitful result. Okay, means the recurrence is inevitable because they were are positive surgeries. Okay, you have gone through the tumor. Then the concept of radicality came. Okay, if you cut through the tumor or you don't give margin, the tumor is gonna recur. So uh, it was the Wardheims. Though the surgery was described before his literature came into the existence, but you will see the importance of data basically. He published a series of 150 patients in 1911. Okay, so he he uh, has shown the world that this radical surgery is possible with a good oncological outcome later on. So this surgery became synonymous by his name, the Wardheim cystectomy. Shota also tried a radical vaginal cystectomy. Okay, why to give an abdominal incision, take the uterus out through vagina, but it, he was uh, like uh, condemned because you can't do lymphadenectomy through the vagina. Okay. Um, so the two names, uh, the Wardheims the I was talking about, after that even, uh, the Japanese came into the picture, okay, and they they popularized the uh, more extended resections, which one is Okabayashi, then Nibayashi, and all those things. You will go through those names in the next few slides. And in the Western world, the Lescos and Meeks. So uh, you can compare the evolution of the surgery in Western countries versus the Japanese uh, surgeons. So. The LASCO gave uh, more radical concepts than the MEEK, okay? And now even we know that the type 3 radical hysterectomy is known as MEEK's uh, hysterectomy. Actually what happened during that time of 1950s, the radiotherapy also came into existence. And the radiotherapy people, they started arguing why those sort of mutilating surgeries, we can cure the patient by radiotherapy, okay? So something some newer concept of or a more radical concept has to come into the existence to compete with the radiotherapy people. That's why the me has popularized that you go a little more wider and we can give a better result than the radiotherapy. Got it? So same here in the Japan, the <coughs> Okabayashi and Mibayashi, they also started doing the more lateral resections or radical surgeries. Then uh, Few more extensions came in the in the form of one was the nerve sparing radical hysterectomy by Kobayashi, and uh, as a option of fertility preservation, the radical tracheotomy by Darjit. Then even the more extended resection uh, by either lateral extended parametrectomy or the total extirpation of the internal lagnary system by few other surgeons. Hockel also gave the concept of, uh, because everyone was talking about the embryological uh, uh, compartments like TME, okay, that uh, what's not, uh, the healed uh, concept, the same, uh, uh, the concept of mesometrialization, they were talking about total uh, meso, in the rectum, what was it? Mesorectal, so here it's a mesometrial. Ultimately, they are synonymous with what they were talking previously also, but the concept was popularized by embryological compartment of total mesometrial excision. So various classification, like after, uh, if someone asks you how you classify, so you can ask them that there are various classification system, we at least Smith's or the recent one is Kodlamoro. And uh, that you already know about those types, type A, B1, B2, C1, C2, D1. So, 
B1, B2 is with or without para-cervical lymphadenectomy. C1, C2 is nerve sparing without nerve sparing. And D1, D2 where you have gone beyond the routine boundaries and here it's basically taking the entire internal lag system. And in D2 even the muscles and parafacial resection which is synonymous with the extended endopelvic resections or So you must be aware of all by these things. Today we will uh, be limited to the radical hysterectomy, that is the type 3 and the nerve sparing hysterectomy. These extended resections are though being uh, they are in the literature but believe me practically they are not being performed okay because these are the patients who are the candidates for radiotherapy so up front it's not being done and if there is a recurrence central pelvic recurrence then also the choice is of pelvic excentration so a sort of excentrative surgery is not going to come into a routine practice but this is a concept uh, where you can learn the concept of para, metrium and para quality. So he has divided the dissection based on that. So para metrium, he has uh, divided into ventral, lateral and dorsal, means posterior. Similarly, the para colpium also ventral, lateral and dorsal. So depending on the extent of resection, you can classify the extent of the surgery. So here it's interesting to see, see we talk about all about this only, the uterine artery vein, the hypogastric nerve and the ureter. But the problem comes when we dissect the paracolpium because there are these vessels which start bleeding and will make the life difficult in preservation of the ureter as well as the autonomic nerve. So this will help you understanding how these inferior vesicular vessels or the vaginal vessels, they come there and even the interconnecting branches of medial and lateral vaginal vessels. So if you have to save these nerves, you have to carefully dissect these vessels. Otherwise the bleeding will start and you will lose the interest of saving the nerves and you will try to finish off the surgery and ultimately the whole goal is gone. So this is how like uh, his type 2 radical hysterectomy where the uh, proper uh, removal of the paracolpium is also being left. So you can go through that and uh, this is also one of his own photograph where he has shown that how the nerves are being separated out. This is the hypogastric nerve forming the inferior hypogastric plexus. So only the bladder branches are cut taking care of the, this is the paramitrium, this is the paracolpium, the, the green dotted line and it's being separated preserving the bladder branch the the whole idea of nerve sparing is preserve the bladder branch which serves the bladder and sexual functions okay so this is the Kobayashi's concept of radical hysterectomy where he has uh, put three supportive bundles the anterior the lateral and the posterior so just see here the anterior bundle it uh, it's basically synonymous with what vesico uterine ligament or vesico cervical ligament. <coughs> then the middle supportive tissue is the cardinal ligament and the posterior supportive tissue is the uterosacral ligament or sacro uterine ligament. And the important structure here is in the middle supportive system you will have this even I think it's in the anterior system the vesico uterine ligament the ureter, and the pelvic autonomic nerves here the pelvic plexus here, hypogastric nerve in the uterocyte and the various pelvic spaces which I think in the Nortme class we have already discussed the paravesical, the pararectal, the lateral one is lesco that's the ureter crossing here, the medial one is okabayashi and the lateral border of the okabayashi is your hypogastric nerve so this is the procedure uh, midline versus uh, financial incision most of the surgical oncologists as a practice we prefer the midline incision because it gives quite good exposure and even access to the parotid lymphodes, though the parotid lymphodes and things is not being located. But yes, and uh, and even if you have to see the uh, supraepigastric plexus, it also helps to improve the visualization. But even if the surgeon who is even uh, doing this financial also can be done. Even I've tried with financial and midline both, 
can give an equal exposure. That's your choice how you try to do that. After the opening, okay, you just try to evaluate the extent of the recession. Don't blindly believe on the MRI findings, okay. I think the best clinical decision will be a pervaginal examination, on clinical examination, and even intraoperatively you have to feed first the parametrium, the lateral pelvic nodes, the paraortic nodes, and if any still feel that the disease has gone beyond the parametrium, you can abandon, okay, without making too much incisions in the peritoneum, because that peritoneal unnecessary dissection will ultimately cost you in the form of increased red cycle. So, suppose if there are pelvic nodes, the routine practice is send them for closer and if they are positive, you can avoid them. So, once you have done that, then either you can start by taking with the infantibro pelvic ligament first, okay? Or even if you don't want to just give a lateral lip on the lateral border of the infantibro pelvic ligament and start forming the spaces. This is the first thing which you do. You can even take the infantibro pelvic and that will add to your exposure. Or even you can directly go with making those spaces. And it's very easy, cut the peritoneum along the external like artery and run deep and parallel to those great vessels and you will just see the avascular spaces. Here, the cardinal ligament with the uterine artery will be the dividing boundary between these two spaces. And once these two spaces are created, you can properly assess the pelvic lymph nodes and can start doing your surgery process. Okay. So this is how, you, oh, these are the screenshots from the modems video which I saw yesterday on the YouTube. So you can see, once the spaces are created, you uh, uh, take the obliterated umbilical ligament medially so that you can make the, the paramecycal space. And here the pararectal space, the dividing boundary is the ureter. So Usually, like we first form the Lasco space. Uh, one fascinating thing when I saw, when I first assisted the radical study, okay, I went gone after reading the literature, I just saw him doing the surgery. He was, first he uh, medialized the ureter, means he made the these spaces, means you are taking the ureter medially. After dissecting all these, then he asked me to take the ureter into the back of and try to lateralize it. And I was thinking why this trauma is being done. Once you are trying to medialize it, first he tried to ask me to, to medial retract it, now he is asking me to take it laterally. The, the thing is, the whole concept is basically the location of the ureter is such. After, when I went again, going back into the library and saw why it's being done, see this, if you have to give the uh, margin here, if you have to recite the parametrial uh, tissue, this organ or ureter has to taken out from the parametrial tissue. So, and the best way is first make your lateral spaces so that you can identify it and after that take this out. So, even if you read the Meeks uh, lit uh, literature, the radical step, uh, see the word times, radical step means lateralization. Of the you have to save and give a adequate margin. You have to first medialize it, taking the adequate lateral margin, and then again lateralize it so that you can carefully take it out from the surgical field. And then, uh, if you are doing type three radical stectomy, where you have to ligate the main trunk of the uterine artery at its origin, and type two you will ligate it at the <coughs> junction of the where it crosses the uterine uh, the ureter, and type one. Near to the surface, and then uh, the posterior leaf of the uterosacral ligament. It's been cut where you identify. Means you have created then the occipital space so that you can see the superior hypogastric nerve. Sorry, the hypogastric nerve, and uh, see the ureter running in that fold, and start lateralizing it. So just give a traction on the uterine artery upwards and with the mixture you can uh, make by peri-adventitial ureter dissection you can uh, dissect the ureter out. Uh, here like um, I think this is the Fuji's book which I have taken those illustrations. Uh, the posterior dissection is being done first here. Even you can uh, do the bladder downing first. Also. Even I do prefer to take the bladder 
first. Okay, so you go into that avascular plane between the bladder and the cervix, taking a cervical fascia along with the uh, uterus. Okay, that helps in um, bringing the uterus down and your ureter uh, the bladder, uh, the deep uterine vein and the the hypogastric now it's been taken. So if it's classical radical hysterectomy where you are not doing nerve sparing, then you can take the uterocycle quite posteriorly, taking the nerves also with that. Okay, but uh, it's not nowadays advisable. I think the, with the radical uh, the nerve sparing approaches, we can give a good oncological outcome because that will uh, ultimately lead up to the sympathetic injury. Okay, so same thing has to be repeated on the left side and then the what we call it ureteric tunnel dissection once you have taken the bladder down you start uh, opening up the vesico vaginal ligament the vesico uterine ligament and uh, uh, the, if you read that book okay the entire one chapter is dedicated for that vesico uterine ligament the anterior or ventral leaflets or posterior dorsal leaflets so uh, he has divided that ligament into the two layers where the ureter is crossing. So you first uh, take the anterior ventral leaflet, taking the cervicovaginal vessels. Mind it, uh, there are two tiny vessels, they come into that region. One is the ureteric branch of the uterine artery, which has to be carefully clipped or ligated. Okay? And uh, just take care that you don't do unnecessary thermal uh, use here because most of the ureteric injuries, as in the last class we have also told, they are indirect thermal injuries rather than direct uh, injury to the ureter. So this is how uh, this area, this is the probably I think the leading part of this whole surgery, careful dissection of this region. Whether you are doing nerve sparing or not, but even to avoid unnecessary bleeding in that area and to avoid injury to the ureter, it has to be carefully dissected, uh, sharp dissection over the ureter so that you can lateralize it. So this is the, uh, the anterior effect has been resected. So you will see the uh, small vessels communicating from the uterine vessels to the bladder vessels, these, these are mycovesical vessels, they can be individually clipped or negative. Okay. Uh, in, see, the confusion between the superior Facial uterine vein, deep uterine vein, because if you see the in the Molum's uh, description, he told that it's a misnomer to call the uterine vein as deep uterine vein, it's a vaginal vein. But it doesn't make difference. I think this superficial and deep is still quite into existence. And uh, most of the time the uh, what you can call it either vaginal vein or deep uterine vein, I think I personally call it deep uterine vein, it runs deep to the ureter. Okay. So, uh, initially the mistake I used to do is, I here, I used to ligate and block the uterine artery and the uterine vein. Okay, in the, my first surgery when I was doing, <coughs> I struggled to take the uterine artery off the ureter because I realized later on that I have ligated it together here. So what happens, the ureter becomes sandwiched between the uterine artery and uterine vein. So don't ligate them in a single clip, okay. First uterine artery, taking the uterine artery or whatever superficial uterine vein is coming anterior to the ureter, okay, then dissect the ureter out and then take the deep uterine. Okay, this way. So the ureter is mobilized till its insertion or entry point into the bladder. And uh, just complete the dissection, okay. This is small paravaginal space which is basically, I tell you in the uh, nerve sparing stectomy, which is called as Fuji space, where the bladder branch are separated from the pelvic branch here, because it's a classical radical stectomy, you're not talking about the nerve sparing approaches. So the dorsal leaflet means once the ureter has been anteriorly mobilized, then you further roll it laterally, and the small vaginal veins or the vaginal artery, like the vaginal vessels which come, Basically, the dissection of the parapalpium, lower para parapalpium. So, those has to be clamped and suture ligated because this is also an area of 
bleed. So once it's been done, just take out an adequate uh, vaginal margin. So this is how it's been done here. The ureter has been quite lateralized. The classical dissection, you even uh, take the inferior uh, hypogastric plexus and uh, the superior hypogastric nerve and these vaginal vessels to take the adequate parapalpal. And then uh, taking the margin, usually like on uh, type 1 is like we talk about 1 centimeter vaginal margin, type 2, 1 to 2 centimeter, type 3, 2 centimeter from the cross disease. So you can feel uh, it through abdominally and can give a lateral link. Or even like uh, this concept was that there is no spillage, should not be any spillage. So put up this cross clamp and uh, you can cut it there. Or I think it's better to visualize the disease by a small opening. And then taking, otherwise sometimes we may compromise the margin if we put a blind clamp. And regarding the closer, okay, drain has to be put, uh, he has put bilateral drains, I usually prefer putting a single central drain. And regarding the closer of the peritoneum, uh, that there is a controversy. Usually I used to put uh, the peritoneal sutures, but uh, ultimately one of the patients I came across with lymphosis formation. So what I hypothesize is, if you close the peritoneum, may increase the risk of lymphosis formation. Uh, though it has got an additional theoretical advantage. Suppose if you have to anyhow refer the patient for adjuvant RT and you have closed the peritoneum, it will help. Okay, it will prevent the unnecessary bowel additions to the pelvis. But usually we don't need it. So I think opening up the space and allowing the whatever the lymph is getting collected here to come into the pelvic, the peritoneal cavity and getting absorbed will probably decrease the chances of lymphosis formation. So usually stop now closing the peritoneum and then you will feel that even after doing that much of the dissection you won't have the much of the peritoneum also. So uh, closer is also not possible most of the time. So this is what are bladder and colonic dysfunctions which can be dealt by the pelvic nerve preservation. So this is again again to uh, stress upon the hypogastric nerve which is a sympathetic nerve from T10 to T to L2 then pelvic splanking nerves. Mind it, there are sacral splanking nerves also, they are sympathetic, okay? So just remember, pelvic splanking nerves, P is for parasympathetic, sacral splanking nerves are sympathetic. Sympathetic also has got splanking nerves, the sacral system. But we usually ignore them. Main things in the inferior hypogastric plexus formation by these two things. And if it's a cross-shaped plexus here, then it gives a bladder branch here and the uterine branch. So you just selectively ligate the uterine branches while preserving the blood margin. That's the concept. And where can be they be injured? Uh, in the uh, the classical radical hysterectomies, they were ligating it. First thing is the hypogastric nerve directly. And when you ligate the uterosacral ligament, okay? So we, when we are dissecting to the corbaishi space there directly, if you have to put a clamp on the uterosacral, the invariably it will take the hypogastric that will lead to the sympathetic injury and parasympathetic overactivity. Second point is where we ligate the deep uterine vein. So that's why selectively we identify the deep uterine vein and ligate it individually. If you put a mass clamp there, it will take the pelvic splanting So because just deep to that vein. Second point that will lead to the parasympathetic injury and sympathetic overactivity. Third point of injury is when we divide the lactovaginal ligament, okay, means the uh, distal part of the uterosacral ligament in that region, there you can damage the, this inferior hypogastric plexus that will lead up to the mixed nerve injury. Or in the paracolpian dissection, I told you that the vaginal veins they will come on the lateral edge of the vagina when we put the clamp there. So. If you don't lateralize the bladder branches and you put a blind clamp here, they will cause damaging the entire parasympathetic system, sympathetic plus parasympathetic to the bladder and uh, sexual organs. Okay, so these are the four locations where they can be injured. So in the classical dissection, the field of dissection was deep to those nerves. But in nerve sparing, you just remain 
superficial to the, those nerves and try to mobilize the nerves on the posterior or retropetrolar plane. So uh, just see what happens that little bit mobilization of this upper uh, rectum or sigmoid colon is needed to see the superior hypogastric plexus. There you can track the superior hypogastric nerve, okay? You can loop it along with that and go into that plane, okay? Create the curvaceous space and lateralize the ureter here and ultimately after ligating the deep uterine vein, you will see the uh, pelvic splanting nerve and peripheral hypogastric plexus. So this is how I was describing the thing. Hypogastric nerve. Just develop this space so that you, your uterocycle ligament, this is okay, it becomes a medialized. Then anterior dissection, uh, you can do it after that or even before that. So just go into that endoscular <coughs> plane and almost two centimeter down to whatever the palpable extent of the disease. Okay, you have to go to that extent, and that's the space. Uh, I think the Yabuki space, which was Agil has already told that uh, space, basically the peritoneal fold of the vagina fold. So if you cut the peritoneum and go into that space, what happens that this vagina uterine ligament, which is a lateral structure, gives a sort of potential space there. Okay, that's the Yabuki space, and uh, the paravagal space is also known as Moro space, and pararectal we already know that Lascaux and Kobayashi. So this is how it's being done and regarding the lymph node dissection, uh, okay, some surgeons they do it after the radical spectrum, some do it before. The advantage of doing first the lymph node is that you can assess the lymph nodal status if they are positive you can abandon or second thing is it opens up all your these boundaries, okay. So your resection of your uterine artery is easy, your uterine vein ligation is easy, okay, identification of these nerves are easy. So you will see the nerve dissection is already been done so that you can see the splinting nerve. This is the internal light vein. So once we have ligated the deep uterine vein, you will see the pelvic splinting nerve. This area of 3 cm I put a circle there is the inferior hypogastric plexus. So you, once you identify it, then you remain medial to those nerves. Okay, so that you can, uh, I'll show you. So, the ureter has been quite lateralized after ligating these vagico vaginal or cervico vaginal vessels. You can see that it's been lateralized. And uh, uh, the repetition of the same thing here. And this is uh, there after careful dissection, even see uh, the if you uh, see that uh, video of Molam, see. He uses the liposuction receptor because these nerves are not easy to see there. If suppose some amount of blood is there, there they are all uh, red and or fat looking at that. So you can use the liposuction receptor or even just by a small mosquito, just try to make a space in that region and make this Fuji space or so-called Fuji space where the bladder branch is lateralized and the vaginal vessels are neutralized. So the same thing I was talking you that not only the uterine artery but the vaginal arteries and inferior vesicle vessels has to be uh, if you are doing a proper under vision nerve sparing surgery then these vessels has to be given importance because if you don't individually see them and ligate them and that bleeding will ultimately ruin your surgery. So this is how after liposuction these nerves looks like a crisscross type. Okay, routinely you won't see such sort of nerve arrangement but if you take the fat out of the field so your plane of dissection is in that field okay so that is how you uh, create the fujis space here taking the bladder branches laterally and the uterine branches medial so these uterine branches can be ligated put a clamp and do a ligation here so that you take the entire bladder system later. So again the same thing, that red dotted line you need to cut after identify this. This is called the D space means lateralization of the bladder branches. 
it's been cut and it's being metalized so once it's been done then you have mobilized your ureter you have mobilized your uh, autonomic nerves that just give up a general margin of 2 cm at least and take the specimen out lymph node dissection has already been done put it in and close the okay and even in the post op like it's just like a routine uh, stectomy patient which we did but sometimes uh, If you have done a careful uh, nerve dissection like that, even the catheter can be removed safely. But some patients, sometimes due to the uh, uh, autonomic nerve injuries, may freeze a tonic bladder or something like that. So even uh, catheter clamping of few days and then taking the catheter out on fourth or fifth day. Yes, and straight. So. Um, Here, this is the area where it has to be carefully. This is the area of injury. Okay, so the uterine, uh, the uretic branch of the uterine artery is being ligated, and don't use the energy source ligate it or put a clip here. Then the uh, your paranectal paravaginal space creation, the vesicular uterine ligament, anterior leaf. The, he is using the liposuction. Just see how it works, and how these nerves becomes more visually prominent. So what you have to do is, the this is the hypogastric nerve which he is holding. So now he has to dissect medial to the hypogastric nerve, taking this plexus and the bladder branch later. This is how it's being done. The uterine, the uterosacral ligament medial dissection. This is the bladder branches, the inferior progressive plexus, and the atlas. Now the uterine artery. I have told you the first uterine artery, partial uterine vein, then uretic mobilization, and then the deep uterine vein. And take care not to go deep, too deep to the deep uterine vein to preserve her. And the paracolpium dissection by taking the either the sometimes you may need to like try to preserve the inferior vesical vessels, but sometimes the vesico vaginal vessels are there in uh, the intercommunicating branches which we need to like. Vaginal vessels we have to like it as we have to take the lateral vaginal margins. This, with this uh, we can conclude to discuss. Thank you.